Hello and a very warm welcome to the Capital Conversation with me, Michael Heyman. My guest today is London's sushi sensation, Robin Rowland. He's now into his second term as chief executive of Yo Sushi and he's been described as a legend in the hospitality industry. He's helped take Japanese street food from a Soho startup to a chain of almost 100 restaurants. And it's also the 20th anniversary of the brand. Robin, great to have you on the show. You've described yourself as energetic to the point of fidgetry. Tell us a little bit about the energy that it takes to build a business of 100 stores. Uh, <clears throat> well, I, I, I'm probably an absolute nightmare to work with, but I'm obsessed about the detail. Um, I'm very interested in what other people are doing in terms of their, their businesses. I'm always looking at the eclectic nature of retail and what's happening in digital. So it's, it's a kind of a, um, a fidgety way of actually managing our business. But what it does do is it gets extraordinary results out of extraordinary people. Right. Now, you're, you're, I mean, you're a sucker for punishment by the looks of it. I mean, you were chief executive, you took a step back, and now you're back again leading the brand. What's brought, is, is, it, is it the fidgetry that's brought you back, or, or was there a real need to get you back into the business? Well, it's, <clears throat> there's a bit of a, bit of a mission, and, I, and not finished, I suppose, for me. I, we're looking at business that was going through a sale process that didn't quite come off the way we anticipated. And it seemed pretty clear to um, all the buyers that the best thing to do is bring me back and actually back me to get the business um, mojo and its um, forward momentum back in there. Um, and I guess that's what I've been doing the last couple of years. So I turned from being a seller to a buyer. Um, that is an interesting kind of uh, transition that any <coughs> private equity CEO has to do at times. Um, but actually, it's worked well for the business as well. But you must have thought you were out. I mean, it's a bit like Al Pacino and The Godfather. Like, you know, I keep trying to get out, but they drag me back in. I mean, you know, you're, I mean, what, what's actually brought you back in? Is it, is it that you've, are you, are you sort of mad about the business or? Just need to keep busy. I, I'm, 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 no, I'm a bit of both. I'm tremendously bu busy anyway because I have other uh, Ned roles which I'm involved with, which we have to talk about later on. But I, <clears throat> I, I felt the Osushi was um, needed uh, another um, another twist to actually move to the next stage. And we were going through some interesting sort of um, challenges on trying to get into America. And we were doing our international piece, and it needed pulling together and then um, you know, get the trajectory right, perhaps for the next next phase. And we are right in the middle of that um, turnaround now. Right, and you talked about the mojo. I mean, in terms of what that actually means for the business, what, what gives a business great mojo? What's the, what's the Yo Sushi mojo? Well, I, I, there's two things which I'm, I'm completely clear about. Any business I'm you know, happily involved with, um, I'm obsessed about happy teams and happy guests. And that's what a mojo really is in hospitality. You can build these things, you can uh, market them, but actually the life and is, is, is in the people. That means if you're eating or dining or basically serving people, that's where the mojo is. So for me, um, forensically understanding what makes that, hap makes that tick and actually analysing and tracking it is so important. And our mojo, we've gone from mid market in terms of scores to top quartile right. on guest recommend I mean, and team engagement. That is a mojo. And nearly 1,600 people working for you. I mean, how do you, how do you maintain that culture over a course of time? We, well, you start by building it, and I guess I, I had to do a little bit of rebuilding coming back in. So I spent 90 days on the road, basically, and I said to our new investors, Mayfair, um, you need to let me go and actually do what I do, which is spend time with the, the general managers and the head chefs. Um, so they understand where we're going, I understand what their issue, issues are, and they basically build the pyramid you know, beneath the team. Of me. And I guess that you know, each of these managers are looking after 30 people, and if you go and meet sort of, uh, 70 of them, of course, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy eventually. Um, and then you have to constantly um, you know, give, them, give them real, real insight in where you're going. I mm. think today you can't tell people what to do. You have to give them some, some inspiration of where you're going. Now, let, let's take you right the way back. I mean, you've been there for 17 of the 20 years of the business. I mean, founded in 97. I'm just thinking, mm. year of Tony Blair, Oasis, Cool Britannia, and suddenly we've got Japanese food into the marketplace. I mean, how did London accept it when you first brought the Yosushi stores here? It was insane. It was amazing. Why? Well, because no one had ever seen. Um, if you go, go back to that time era, you're talking about Peace Express as being you know, the brand to go to, or Wagamama's just started. Um, both brilliant businesses. Uh, Nando's, first three or four stores. I mean, there, there were nothing really at that stage. And Yo Sushi was completely defying um, all the kind of um, the logic of how you, should, how you should actually deliver food. This conveyor belt um, serving, you know, maybe 60, 70 dishes, which had uh, unusual food, which had been priced out of anybody's ability to, to buy. Because the conveyor belt was the magic, right? I mean, people were just. Everybody, everybody saw this as the tech restaurant of its time, wasn't it? it the was, robots, the, yeah. the conveyor belts. Well, it would be that, and also the Japanese food was so expensive, and it's only because it could be, not because it had to be. And so the Yosushi know, debunked that. You could actually serve you know, uh, food at a reasonable price, which was authentic, and it was Japanese in this extraordinary technical environment. But it was more kind of Californian, Asian 
it's good cuisine at the time rather than Tokyo street food as it's yeah, actually yeah, it, come it, there. It, it, it was, it was uh, a the, particular take. Yeah, it's the West Coast um, uh, take on sushi um, and uh, and popularised, I guess, in, in terms of the Western taste. But and we've moved quite a long way in the last, um, you know, let's say the last four or five years, and certainly the last two years, much more to going back to Tokyo to our roots and looking for more interesting cuisine to add to the sushi. Mm. So broadening the food offer. But I, and I remember that kind of early two thousands when Yo Sushi it was a it was very much the heart and soul of the London food scene. I mean, you you really felt that it was something special to London. What happens when you take that that business nationwide, in fact, internationally now, in terms of serving a big city like London? Does London get a bit snobbish about it in terms of you can go anywhere and find this, or does the magic still remain? It's, it's, very, it's a really interesting sort of um, experience. I mean, going, going national means you become uh, a brand which has not got quite the catch it used to, but. On the other hand, you have reliability and you have confidence and you have um, repeat visits. Now, we opened Glasgow last week. It is a smash hit. And we basically had a restaurant. We closed and we just rebuilt a new one a week ago. It was queues out the door. I mean, it'll be full right now. Um, it, it depends on where you are. I think London is probably the most advanced um, food capital in the world. And is I London still... The, the great performer in the in the set for you. No, L London's 20 restaurants out of 75 at the moment in the UK. So it is, is a very important component and very, very important for us in terms of Selfridges, in terms of Harvey Nichols, in terms of railway stations. These are signposts of the brand and they are brilliant, brilliant pit stops. But it's a, it's a massively competitive market, isn't it? I mean, London, it's a very hard market to keep your market share, presumably. I mean, what do you do to keep it fresh? You have to keep changing your food. I mean, the reality is that um, people's patience in London are, is very, very <laughs> finite. Um, you have to develop your food offer. You have to make sure your marketing is, is cutting some cut through to the younger ones, particularly. You have to make sure your service standards and your food standards are better than they've ever been. Um, this is a tough market, but I, I mean, Yo Sushi is more than holding its own. And in fact, we've had you know significant growth, six percent in the last um, twelve months. And that's in, in London or, or, in the, or nationally. nationally. That includes London. So the point is, it's no difference to us in London than outside. Um, I don't see, I don't, I'm not so um, fixated on London. I think Manchester's got a great food scene. I think that um, uh, even, you know, Birmingham's got a good food scene going on. I think we can get a little bit um, pretentious in London about right. this. A bit pretentious. Mm. But, I mean, you're big on branding. I mean, you talk a lot about authenticity. How do you, how do you feel about a British brand selling Japanese food to, to the rest of the country. I mean, is that your definition of pretentious as well, perhaps? Uh, maybe, but I think our job is to democratise <laughs> Japanese food and do it in a fun and effective and honest way. Um, and so I don't, I don't feel there's any... Uh, uh, it's, it's not an oxymoron. I mean, to be a brand that happens to be British serving Japanese food, I think you can do do it. Um, the reality is, it would take it would take an English person to actually navigate the UK to mm. deliver it. Um, and some of the great greatest um, brands are are from you know taking other people's cuisine and putting it into their own country. But, but do you feel that is there is there an authentic side to this? I mean, you talk a lot about in your own literature about Japanese street food. I mean, how do you how do you get that connection with? The real deal in terms of the street markets of Tokyo or or other big Japanese cities. You have to spend a lot of time. You have to spend a lot of time and attention on it. And <clears throat> I'm very lucky. Lucky we have a fantastic executive chef, uh, Mike Lewis, who um, he's in and out of Japan probably five, six times a year. Uh, we still work with the same Japanese suppliers we were working with 15, 20 years ago. The same lady still produces our doriaki and uh, still makes in a, uh, quite a few of our other dishes. And I, I, we work very, very closely with our Japanese suppliers. Uh, and we still prepare from scratch on the premises. If we weren't doing that, we wouldn't be able to produce the variety and the quality of the food we are producing. Do, do you think that consumers actually feel that they are eating in? A Japanese restaurant when they come to Yo Sushi, or does that even not matter? I don't think it matters. I, I think both people use Yo Sushi as, a, as a, uh, a fast, casual, quality, healthy food offer. Now, 20 years ago, that was just mind blowing. Today, you've got quite a few other competitors in the same space. But Yo Sushi over indexes in terms of spend per square foot in the airports, in the railway stations, in the Selfridges, because we're so bloody good at what we do. Right, and, and what's the Yo? What's, what's the Yo signify in terms of the brand? It's fast, fun, fresh. Fast, fun and fresh. Now, in terms of how you keep it fast, fun and fresh, in terms of the actual, if you like, the single bit of advice you'd give yourself in terms of the next steps, what, what, what might that be? Uh, don't be complacent. Don't be complacent. Uh, keep your eye, look, look, look what's coming up behind. You've got a one second advantage. It's like going around a racetrack.
And, and how do you keep up to date in terms of the, the knowledge that you acquire? Well, I, I suppose I'm lucky. I, I mean, you call me a veteran, which is slightly uh, disquieting, but <laughs> I, I, I love this business, and I, I'm, all my, most of my, my social life is in this business. And so uh, I'm lucky enough to know a lot of entrepreneurs, so young you know, people coming through. I know the old hacks like myself. Um, I read a lot. Um, I was in Boston, New York last week, and I, I'm in Dubai next month. I think I see, I see food um, uh, as probably one of the most exciting reflections on, on, on cultures where I go. So it, to me, it's an absolute delight and a pleasure to be, feel slightly um, paranoid all the time about yo. We're going to take a short break now, Robin. Uh, we've sampled a conveyor belt of conversation from the secrets of sushi to how you take a gourmet business global. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This is The Capital Conversation with me, Michael Heyman. My guest today is the king of katsu, none other than Yo Sushi boss Robin Rowland. Now, before the break, we were talking a little bit about the early days of the business and what you brought to it. You've also said that you've run the business with the mindset of a 20-year-old. Now you're going to be turning 21. What happens <laughs> when a business like yours grows up? What do you have to start doing differently? Uh, I think you have to listen to younger people. You've got to employ people who are uh, more in touch and more talented perhaps than you are and actually um, surround yourself with extraordinary um, a collective vision of a younger generation. So you've got to get the millennial mindset. Absolutely, yeah. But in terms of actually you're growing this business, can that kind of mindset scale? I mean, how big can Yo Sushi get? Well, I, th I think Yo, in the UK, we could probably go another 50%. We've got 150 sites maybe. Or, um, uh, and overseas, America, we could do double, if not treble, that. Um, and the franchise so could piece, be what? Sort of it, it could be thousands, thousand units. It's quite, it's quite, it's, it's definitely conceivable. And in terms of getting yourself match fit for that, where where are you learning from? What are the things that you're personally doing to sort of make sure you can run a business of that scale? Well, I guess the pillars are you've got to get your finance sorted out. So you've got to find a great investor, pay the bills, pay the bills um, and actually front out the the development costs. Um, you need you need really strong leadership in terms of the um, the operator. Um, and then, in particular, the brand like ours, you need a world-class marketeer. Uh, and I guess they're the key pillars. And then the bit about our business around HR, we have a fantastic people director, you know, and they need to understand how to motivate these people. But what about external events? What about food fads? What if, what if we, you know, Mexican food is the big thing right now? How do you make sure that the sort of food you're selling stays front of mind? And do you worry about a fickle consumer in that, in terms of taste just going elsewhere? Could that undo? The very ambitions of that business model. You can, but if you if you anticipate where where the, the trends are going, like the reason we're doing Japanese street food is because street food is prevalent, you know, with um, dinorama and the such like. But you can't um, become yo Mexican, right? Or no, could you? No, no, right? no. You don't I mean, need to. You don't need to. I, I, I'm an absolute believer that pasta and pizza were the, were the 21st century. Um, oh, 20th century. 20th century. 20th century. But the 21st century is all about Asian food. There's no question noodles and rice are where the 21st century is going. If you were starting again, if you were doing this business in sort of 2017, would you, would you basically have the same business model? Might you start in a completely different part of the world in terms of where you find your inspirations? Uh, possibly, yeah. I mean, I, I, <clears throat> I'm quite interested in, in some other businesses which uh, I've invested in and I've watched. But I think, you know, Yo, Yo has, a, has its place. It's, it's grown of age and it's actually adapted. But there are other, other food offers and I you know, happen to sit on two other boards which um, has given me sort of an insight into what's happening in pubs, which is quite interesting at the moment, and, you know, with coffee, with uh, Cafe Nero. So, so what's the next big hot, hot sort of food sector, do you think? What, what are we going to be eating uh, in, in a year's time? Uh, well, not years' time. I think in a few more years. I think Latin America is still, still of, of age. It's coming. Um, there's, uh, there's fantastic food offers there, which are not, I don't mean Mexican. I mean, go further south. That's right. coming. Now, with a business like yours, obviously the economy will, will have a, its sort of influence in terms of just how, how much disposable income people are prepared to spend on food. Right now, <coughs> with the way things are in, in the UK economy, does that give you any any cause for concern for Yo Sushi in terms of the sort of maintaining that velocity of consumer spend in the restaurants? It's, I mean, it's, it's, to say it's not easy, it's, it's easy, it'd be ridiculous. It, it's tougher than it's ever been because of the rising costs. But in terms of top line sales, I mean, Yo's more than holding its own. And I've seen this happen before because if you go back to 2008 and 9, Yo basically benefits from people trading down from fine dining. OK, and so just going from posh restaurants to I, simply can't, I can have a quick bite to eat. Yeah, and, it's, and we know it's fresh, we know it's in the quality, and we can't afford the 25, 30 pound a head. 
head. So we'll do yo for you know 15, 20 pound a head. Um, but can you do that when you've got a bigger yeah. business to run? I mean, does that does that rule still does that does that I, hold true? I, I think it does because I think today's world. I mean, it's it's just you know, another. Uh, in eight years on, I, I, I think that we're going to do just fine because, but the real issue is, but it is it's dog eat dog because unless you've got great locations, and great people, so and great food, you are going to have a very tough time the next couple of years. And, and do things like do, do your sort of I guess costs do they do they sort of change over time? I mean, what's the currency done in terms of the changes? In fact, does inflation have its effect on on fish prices and things like that? Yeah, I mean, the, the real issues that we're facing, I guess, like and a lot of business, one is, is um, national living wage, and there's rents, there's rates, and then in our case, FX, because we buy so much of our quality ingredients from overseas. So salmon is a world trade economy. economy. Um, and are the costs of salmon going up? Oh, yeah, it is. But we, we buy, fortunately, we buy intelligently two-year contracts, and we actually know when to dip in and dip out of the, the market. Mm. Uh, I just bought probably the most extraordinary stock out of Scotland for the next two years. But, but you have to be, but FX is a problem to so a lot of businesses are importing. And I just don't think you can Pass on all this pricing to the customer today. Now, one of the things that, as we mentioned, you were famous for was the whole idea of tech. I mean, tech is being debated right now, food tech, things are going to change on the restaurant scene. How will that play out in Yo Sushi stores in the future? What are we going to see? Well, I, I'm really excited about it because I, I think by not being the early adopter on everything, because we, we stood back and watched what works from uh, payment methods to actually social to um, interactivity in the restaurants, I've probably got the best um, uh, mapped out. Uh, plan in any, any 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 restaurant group in the UK. Now that will come to fruition in the next couple of years. I'm, I'm not going to speculate on it because this is where we're going next. Would you have AI in the in the stores? Uh, that's definitely in, in the mix. Yeah. Would that mean less less people working for you? Uh, possibly, but you should, you should. Everyone should be looking for efficiencies from ordering to um, you know, basically billing and leaving. Everyone wants efficiency. The things that really really naff people off is basically I can't get my food fast enough and I can't pay the bill. But, I mean, just, just on this point about job insecurity, I mean, it's not just the technology. I mean, I was reading that 44% of your, of your people, of your staff, your team are from EU countries. I mean, in terms of their feeling about the immigration issue, I mean, what's the business's position on that? Well, I'm really delighted we're now into politics. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, are, are you, I mean, no, are no, we I'm, able to mention the B word? Are, no, are you a Remainer no, are, or a... No, I'm, I'm def <laughs> definitely a Remainer. I mean, I'm, I'm unashamedly. Um, uh, I, I sit on the board of the LMR, which basically represents 13% of the working population. And the LMR just... Uh... LMR is a ridiculous name. It's Association of Licensed Managed Re Retailers. Hmm. It stands for everyone who basically runs pubs, restaurants, clubs, hotels. And what are they? Are they are they in or out? Ah, uh, oh, that's a really good question. They are uh, apolitical because they have to be, um, but I think the the concerns are really around what's going to happen in terms of immigration. But surely a lot of your people uh, are sad. They're thinking I might not even be here in a few years' time. Yeah, well, the, the, the reality is most of them are. If it's, if they're here, um, they're not leaving at the moment. But are, my big worry is that when they do leave, they will never get replaced. And uh -huh. we. We employ extraordinary people. I mean, the day of Brexit, I, I, I just got up and I just didn't think about it. I went around 10 restaurants, one after another, basically talking to as many people I could in restaurants. And they were absolutely devastated. How ready do you think London is as a city for Brexit? I, mean, I think it woefully underprepared. I think there will be a huge scramble for uh, people who are qualified to do jobs. I think the unskilled work is also going to be um, desperately in demand. I think we have a major problem, which I'm not sure the government has a clue about how to face. Do you, do you think that London, I mean, could, could you see less investment for Yo Sushi in the London market because of Brexit? Uh, no, I mean, we're a good site, we'll find a way to do it. I mean, we are a good employer, we, we win, you know, employee awards. So I, mean, I mean, this is a thing we'll, we'll muddle on through, but if you're building a world-beating business, is London still the place to do it from? Uh, yes, because the economics are so compelling. I mean, the only issue is it's about the, the availability of property. Um, availability of property and people are two defining factors. I think, I think people wouldn't put us off necessarily, but it would probably slow down. Do, do you get a sense, though, that, that the British brand is changing because of Brexit? I mean, to what degree does Yo Sushi start to decouple from the idea of being a really successful British brand selling international food to actually, you know, to use the Prime Minister's phrase, being a, a business of no nation? Uh, well, we've always been a business no nation. I, I don't think my team are, are, are uh, particularly trapped in the UK head. I mean, most of my, I mean, just this morning, we had people flying in from Dubai, and uh, my team, I was on the phone on the way here to my, my MMD in America. I think we've, and, we, and we're all up in Glasgow last week, I don't think we really see 
the kind of pathetic boundaries of the M25. We never have. We just, I think we live in a, a slightly more virtual reality world, including our investors. They, they don't see these boundaries. Right. I mean, so a quarter of a million Japanese people come to the UK every year. Most of them come to London. Mm -hmm. do, do any of them come to, to Yosushi? Do they yeah. actually find their way? And, and what, what do they make of it? Well, I think they're, they're a bit baffled to begin with sometimes. Um, Kaiten restaurants in Japan are very, very limited. They are sort of like a, a happy to a very, very simple menu, maybe 25 dishes at tops. Um, quality are basically fairly average. And they look at Yo's belt and go, that's supposed to be on a fine dining menu. I'm not sure why it's here. Um, but you know, if you go to St. Paul's any day or St. Pancras, you'll see an awful lot of Asian faces doing Yo. Uh, but I mean, is there, is, there a, is there a Japanese Robin Rowland in Kyoto selling fish and chips? What, what kind of advice would you give to him to selling a, setting up a brilliant London business in Japan? Uh, do it brilliantly and make sure you communicate what your food's all about. Um, and Pizza Express is in, in Japan. I mean, it's, um, they're, 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 they're growing quite fast. And so you're feeling optimistic about where this might go in terms of your second tenure as chief exec? Uh, what, what excites me is the, you know, the brand, brand extensions. We've done this box park, which was a con uh, no conveyor belts and a couple of containers banged together. Done that. Uh, done a fantastic takeout offer at um, uh, St Pancras. Uh, opened this stunning restaurant in Glasgow. I mean, the beauty of Yo is there isn't a script. We, we, we basically have designed our own story here. Uh, and, I, and I'm not constrained by the past. It's really very, very important that we look for you know, where, where, where guests are going to be. We want to go out to festivals next year. I've got a team that basically can take the brands um, and they're unfettered and that, that, that their ability to do that. Well, a thank you to my guest, Robin Rowland. Thank you for giving us such a brilliant sort of viewpoint from what it takes to run a business like Yo Sushi and what it means to build a business in London and indeed internationally. Well, that's all we have time for. And a big thank you to my guest this week, Robin Rowland. And if Robin's story of sushi success has left you hungry for more, here's a generous tip. Join me next time for the Capital Conversation.